Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ninth webinar organized by QWorld. And I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Eliska Grafova. And um, the title is going to be Understanding Quantum Matter Using Intelligent Machines. I'm going to be one of the moderators. The other moderator is going to be Tonda Hoskovet. And we also, as moderators, we would like to thank Q World for organizing this webinar, namely Abu and uh, Ada, who are responsible for providing this technical background. And, um, and I would like to just mention that uh, we have the code of conduct. So uh, we are dedicated to providing harassment free experience, experiences for everyone. The idea is that we should all feel nice and we should enjoy this webinar all together. And uh, everything is going to be recorded, available also streamed on YouTube right now. So if you have any difficulties connecting, you can always switch to the YouTube channel and follow. We're going to expect, we're going to, and the recording will be available also on YouTube later. So we, the format is going to be that Eliska will start to give uh, her presentation. You can ask questions in the chat boxes. If those are relevant, we will ask the question right away during the presentation. And those questions that you have submitted in advance, we will ask them at the end of the talk. And, um, and um, yes, now I will pass on uh, to Tonda to continue. Great. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Eliška Greplova, who is an assistant professor at Kavli Institute of Nanoscience at Delft University of Technology in Netherlands currently. Um, I uh, know about her that uh, she's been working in uh, several incredibly interesting fields for the several uh, for several years. Namely, she's been working uh, on quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and condensed matter physics, all of which are, uh, you know, quite difficult topics. And uh, she and her colleagues were able to find ways of transferring knowledge between them and coming up with new ideas. Um, she uh, started with her undergraduate uh, degree at CTU in Prague. Uh, then she moved to Munich in Germany, and then she obtained her PhD at Aarhus University in Denmark, and also postdoctoral fellowship at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, I'm going to leave it up to her to introduce the, the topics that she's going to be talking about today. Thank you so much, Donda and Aurel, for the introduction. And thank you very much for having me today to the Q World. Let me quickly start sharing my talk. So hopefully you can now hear me, see me, and also see my slides. So again, I am very happy to be here. And I would like to tell you a little bit of this, like about a, a little bit of this interdisciplinary hybrid stuff, namely, how can we understand quantum matter using intelligent machines? So the two topics I would like to cover today are at the intersection of two fields that were collecting quite a lot of hype and also a lot of success lately. One is quantum computing and the other one is artificial intelligence. And since a few years ago, there have been like a, new emerging field at the overlap of those. And in our group and with other collaborators, we have been working on how to, how to, how we can use these two fields to help each other, both with artificial intelligence on a quantum side and with quantum techniques on the artificial intelligence side. So let us start with the quantum computers. You heard a lot, of a lot about them already in this series. This is a picture I found in like a nice feature on quantum computing in a Wired magazine. And you may, you may recognize that it's an illustration of a dilution fridge. You may also know that 
in practice, quantum computers come in many, many different shapes and sizes. Here are just three examples, superconducting qubits, trapped ions, and Rydberg atoms. But there is many, many more. But what it really comes to that it, it doesn't, the system doesn't matter so much as your ability to engineer it and control it in a way so it could access information you cannot access otherwise. I was thinking about how if I would have to define quantum computing in the context of this talk, I would say that quantum computers are devices that can simulate physics in a, in a highly controlled manner, specifically the kind of physics that is inaccessible to us otherwise. What do I mean by that? Many things that are super important for us to understand, they are influenced by quantum quantum effects. And the problem with quantum physics is that classical computers cannot simulate it so well. But if you use quantum system itself, you can. And that's the whole thing that, that makes these devices so interesting. Just to give some examples, it would be whatever, whatever, whatever example you can think of from advanced chemistry, designing new materials, energy applications, for example, development of new batteries, drug design, or, uh, or even a climate change related things like sequestration of CO2 from the atmosphere. All these things have in common that they are governed by some complicated process for which quantum physics matters. And for example, for chemistry, you remember your high school chemistry classes, and that's a good approximation for a lot of things. But it so happens that for complicated things like designing fertilizers that will not completely kill the planet, that's not, that's not good enough. So doing these things on the computer is currently out of, out of our reach. There are other things like quantum cryptography and quantum communication, but in the context of this talk, let's think about quantum computers as these highly controlled devices that can simulate other things. Then there is the second topic that has been on a lot of people's mind lately, and that's, uh, that's artificial intelligence. So again, just like a pedestrian non-rigorous definition, so we kind of know in which context are we going to think for the rest of this talk, I would say that AI is class of computer algorithms that learn and that determine their action from data and experience. Oftentimes, when we think about AI, we think about, we think about similar learning process as a human brain. And that's why we are giving it this artificial intelligence fancy title. But when it really comes to it, it's just the different types of programming. You might have you might have read about it in the context of like having artificial intelligence distinguishing pictures from each other. When you want to decide whether you got a picture of a dog or a cat, you will not like you will not run some for loop in the in your brain with 10 criteria that you always check that helps you decide. You have as a human lots of experience and based on that experience you will decide whether it's a dog or a cat. And this decision may be sometimes hard, right? Depends on a subspecies and so on. So, so there is this difference between like programming deterministic set of actions that the program should perform or programming in a sense that you, that you optimize what your algorithm should do based on the data that you show it. So just some examples again, you probably also know it that you are using this kind of algorithms every day. Every time you use Google Translate, every time you use Siri, every time you ask Siri to do something for you, it's running some kind of artificial intelligence or one of the subfields of artificial intelligence algorithm. So like relevant examples would be language translation, data generation, image recognition, or, uh, or recommendation systems. So now we have these two things in mind. And 
you already you already can guess where this is going because in the context of quantum computers i am telling you there is lots of things that we cannot simulate exactly and in the context of artificial intelligence i tell you oh but may, we have this ways to just learn from enormous amounts of data instead of programming things rigorously so there is already some overlap that you can see because ai is good for learning from data and quantum computing comes with ton of those data specifically let me let me now mentioned two challenges that in the context of quantum technologies we are facing nowadays that are kind of difficult to solve. One is like a good title for it would be learning the physics of your quantum device. Why is this important? So I say that there are specific things that quantum computers can do and no other classical machine can do. So that's great, except that now we are in this pre-competitive stage where we are building machines that are big enough that no classical computer can simulate them. But at the same time, they are still uh, prototypes that are made in a lab by a graduate student or uh, by a startup company. So maybe before we let that thing de design the next generation of vaccines, we should probably check it's doing what we want it to do. However, how do you check that if nothing except a quantum computer can simulate a quantum computer? So there's this kind of there's this kind of loop of a loop of things that we are building this super powerful, unprecedented technologies. But at the same time, we need to have a methods of verification that they are doing what they should. And indeed, it turns out that artificial intelligence can help with this. Second thing is uh, automated control of the quantum devices. One thing that you didn't see on all those super pretty pictures I showed at the beginning of my talk on the introductory slides is that how it works in practice is that next to the quantum device, there is one or a group of the graduate students who have to monitor and tune it and turn the knobs all the time because it's so complex. That picture of the fridge had a lots of wires and we have to we have to control all of these things all the time. And again, ideally, maybe you don't want to deliver your quantum technology of the future with the graduate student attached to it. It should just work by itself. So what, what, these, what these students nowadays do, that they have lots of experience and they can tune the device just right based on this experience. So they have like a kind of, you can think about it like a control knobs that are, that are adjusting some complicated optimization landscape and if you turn them just right you find optimum of your optimization landscape and your quantum device works exactly as it should so these are two things that are that are hard to do otherwise and in both cases it turns out that this ability of the artificial intelligence algorithm to learn from the experience can help us with these tasks that otherwise would not be super scalable. Before we get to that, let me let me introduce, let me explain a little bit in more, more depth why is it so hard, this quantum computing and quantum simulation. So you may know that quantum states are represented by a wave function. And you may also know that this is a complex vector in some Hilbert space, but that's not super important right now. It's just an object that represents what the quantum state is. However, this, this object doesn't scale well. If I would have a system of two qubits, I could save it in the vector that has size four. If, if I had 10 qubits, it will be 10 to the 24. If I had a hundred, it will be 10 to the 30. And if I had a thousand, it would be 10 to the 300. And for all the, those fancy things I mentioned at the beginning that we would like to have and have our quantum computers do, you need thousands of qubits at most. 
just to give a reference why this is a big number, people give this thing that like age of the universe is 10 to the 22 seconds. I am not sure how that's supposed to help you like compared to the length of the vector, but we can at least agree that like we see that age of the universe in seconds is a very big number. And it's not even super big compared to the compared to the amount of bits we would need to store these wave functions. So in the end, what happens is that no classical computer in the world can deal with this kind of thing. So, however, there are two things that are kind of like two approaches. You have this, when you are a theorist, you will figure out the theory that gives you this wave function. And from the wave function, you can go this way and predict how measurement would turn out. But those wave functions, they are kind of, it's nice to like have them theoretically, but then in practice, it's really hard to do a large scale simulation. But if we have them, we can predict all the measurement results. We can calculate whatever we want that is relevant for our experiment. On the other hand, you, are, you can be an experimentalist and measure your wave function. And when you do that, you project into some space. So here you can literally actually take a measurement by, by taking a picture. This is a picture of the ultra cold atoms in an optical lattice. I'm going to talk about this system a little bit later. And when you take a picture, you see that this is not some big object. This is, this is a really big system. It has like a 50 sides with 10 atoms. That's a lot. But it's just now it's just a picture that has whatever this is, like nine, nine times nine, nine times two entries. So that's very simple to store, except that by taking the picture, I make the wave function collapse. And then I don't have that much information about what it actually was. But taking this experimental pictures, that's accessible to us. And we can do it with these devices. We can store them. And then the question is, OK, like, but can I learn something about the physics of the system from this. Let me explain how this works on the example that you may remember from your undergraduate statistical physics class. And that's an icing model. It's a chat, it's, it, this is actually even classical model. So this doesn't even come with many challenges that quantum systems do, but it's a simple, it's a simple model to look at for now. It spins on a two-dimensional lattice. And it turns out, if they all sit in the ground state, they are all aligned. So everything that is blue is spin pointing down, and the orange dot are spin pointing out, up. When you add temperature to the system, you find out that phase transition happens, that at some point of the temperature, it stops mattering this alignment. And Suddenly, you have spins up and down, however, however they want to be. The reason for this is this, that the system is described by some Hamiltonian operators. Either you already know it, and if you don't, just trust me that looking at this formula, it tells you that the, low, it has the, low, the system has the lowest energy if all the spins are aligned, like in the picture all the way in the left of your screen. However, when you start adding temperature, it stops mattering the energy difference between spins being aligned like this or spins being misaligned like this. So what ends up happening is that you have this phase transition. And maybe in some of your undergraduate classes, someone made you calculate this thing. And either you can do something called Onsager solution, or you can use renormalization group. However, just starting from this Hamiltonian and doing like several pages of really annoying calculation, you can exactly calculate where this tra phase transition is. OK, but now what? Now, imagine that I don't know all of this stuff. And I don't know the normalization theory, and I just don't want to think about it. Is there a way just to take this data, not knowing anything about this Hamiltonian stuff that I just said, and learn about this phase transition just from the data alone? And the answer to this is yes. It's something that uh, Lei Wang realized back in 2016, and this was one of these seminal papers that jump started our field, even though this is a very simple problem. I can take this 
spin pictures. I just take, I just sample from my systems at different temperature. I take these pictures at whatever temperatures and I show them to a clustering algorithm. Here, there is no intelligence, neurons, machine learning. This is just a rule how to cluster your data. If you are a linear algebra buff, I can tell you that you just find uh, singular values and you project your, your, sorry, your system on the two biggest ones. So you end up in a two-dimensional space. And now when I was making this plot, I colored all my dots with the color of the temperature that I, that I took the sample with. And so you see that these two clusters on the sides are the, the, are the low temperature that is perfectly aligned and the middle is the high temperature. And if I would just find the color that corresponds to the stuff that are in the middle that are not aligned or completely misaligned, I can just studying the color on the color axis here I can guess pretty, I can guess pretty exactly what this phase transition is. And now this is really, this is really key thing to understand because I didn't need Hamiltonian. I didn't need to think about statistical physics. All I did was took a few pictures of spin aligns up and down. I ran some clustering algorithm that is not even particularly smart. It's just a fixed thing that I can run on my data set. And from the clusters it created, I can find that there are two distinct phases in my system. There is a more, more artificial intelligence like way to do it. Why am I introducing now more complicated way to do it? If all the complicated phases of matter, all the different all the different chemistry things, all the different energy processes we want to simulate, if they would have such a simple structure that I could just run this clustering algorithm and be done with it, then all the physics would be solved. Except it's not true, and this only works for this very simple model that we teach students in the undergraduate classes. When you want to do something complicated, you can use the so-called neural network. So I schematically drawn it here. Really what it is, like, like you have uh, neurons connected in the human brain. These are just some objects that we call neurons that are, connect, that are connected by weights that we adjust during training. I will show it a picture that is in one phase and I tell the network, look, this is the picture in the aligned phase and this is the label. And I just run it through the network and I see if it classified this picture co correctly. And based on how well it did, I adjust the weights. And when I show it a few thousand of images with this label phase A, phase B, it will become really smart at distinguishing phases like this. This is something that Juan Carasquilla and Roger Melko then did in 2017. And this is, yeah, this is a figure from their paper where they exactly did what I just described, fed in the neural network samples from a different phases that were labeled with the phase. And after a while, the neural network learns to distinguish the two phases. However, there is still a drawback to this because to teach the neural network which phase it's in, you need to tell it which phase I am sampling. Meaning like this, I can never discover any new physics. It's the same way like if you tell your kid the difference between cat and a dog, it's a very different thing that like, than like discovering a new math theorem, let's say, right? So, so still we are doing something, we are still doing something that is not super complex, but it's really important to to appreciate how cool this is because the this supervised type of learning it doesn't work just for this single spin model i am showing you now it works for an arbitrary thing you can sample from the most complicated hamiltonian we know and do this supervised thing and it's going to work and i'm going to show you this later on a state of art quantum experiment so just to quickly i will not explain this in detail i will just quickly point you out to to our, our paper from the last year. 
you can achieve exactly the same even without the supervision. There, is, there are methods to train networks on the using the control parameters in the system and then studying what errors it makes when predicting them to identify the phases without a priori knowing these labels. And now there is a lots of lots of work, lots of work in this direction because this is exactly what you want if you want to test if your experimental data contains a new phase of matter that maybe your theory cannot capture just yet. So this was the this was the general general introduction into the spirit of how this can work. So let me now take you more to the more to the border of what we are doing in practice and how this can help a real life quantum experiment. So what I am going to talk about now is a collaboration we have with the Greiner Lab at Harvard University, where they have really huge quantum devices, which are one of those that cannot be exactly simulated anymore. The devices they are talking about, they are building, that I, I just drew here like a very schematic pictures, are ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. Basically, what you can do is that you can create optical lattice using two counterpropagating laser beams, and then you can put neutral atoms in this lattice, and the atoms will see this periodic potential. And then modulating the, the, the controls of your system, you can make the, the, the atoms will hop from side to side, they will interact with each other. And like this, you can again you can simulate the pretty complicated physics in a highly controlled settings because you are just controlling all those lasers so you can make your atoms do whatever you want and simulate interesting hamiltonians that perhaps we couldn't study exactly otherwise so the specific system here it's not super important, but it's like a quasi 1D system. It's a system that's really long in one dimension, but only has two rows of well in other dimension. So you will end up with having like a hundred sides. And in this system, there are three important parameters. I am not going to write the Hamiltonian now, you can ask me later, but there are three, three things that, that matter for physics of this system. One is the hopping from 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 side to side so there is some hopping amplitude that tells you that tells you whether the particle how what is the what is the probability that the particle will move to the next side when there is two particles on the same side they will interact together so they will have some some um, attraction or a repulsion depending on the setting of your experiment and then you have some extra then you have a chemical potential that's just a parameter that like tells you the energy of the site so i will just now do like a quick quick calculation about this specific system the the Hilbert space, the, the wave functions of the system, they will have dimension. If, if I would only put as little as 10 atoms in this 100 sides, I will get something like 10 to the 13 wave function vector length. And additional problem, I need to estimate all these parameters. If I only wanted to do super rough estimate and each of the parameters I need to estimate, I would only have to pick from five numbers which one is best. I can calculate the combinatorics and I end up with the number 10 to the 10 to the 240 or something. So, so that's not that's not great. That that scales that scales very badly. But again, I just want to find these parameters because I understand basic physics that and I shouldn't say I that they are implementing in the lab. So I know what are the terms of the Hamiltonian. What I don't know are what are these interaction and hopping parameters that really will determine the physics of my system. And I can do exactly the supervised thing I was explaining you at the beginning. Our experimentalist friends measure the system many, many times. So what you do here is that you measure with something called something called uh, uh, ultra cold gas microscope, and you can literally zoom on the lattice and take a picture. And here the green thing shows you where the atom exactly is. 
So you do the physics with your system that you want to do, and then you just do a snapshot, take a picture. Then you do it many times. And then these, these pictures, they of course don't have a complete information about the wave function, but perhaps they have a complete information about this Hamiltonian parameters that I want to learn. And it turns out that this is precisely the case. I can make such, I can make such feedforward neural networks that take the measured data as an input and map those measured data on the parameter I am seeking to estimate. Specifically in this case, we made one neural network per parameter. So we factorized the problem a little bit and it turned out that it, that it wasn't a problem. So I didn't have to go, I didn't have to diagonalize I didn't have to do all of this, all of these things that I cannot do for 240 reali for 10 to the 240 realization of the system. All I had to do was to make a supervised, supervised learning that determines the parameter. And it's the same type of supervised learning that tells you this is the cat, this is the dog, this is a panda type of thing. You just have to figure out some some might the technical things that I'm skipping for now, how to, how to pre-process and organize the data in which form to show them to, to the network and stuff like that. So I will just quickly show you, oh, now it works, okay. I will just quickly show you uh, one, one result slide that is mildly technical. So this is on a subsystem that we can also exactly simulate so we can benchmark how well it's working. This thing here is exactly this two-dimensional lattice and the blue blobs are the interactions that happens on the sides and the orange connections, those are the hoppings. And the color bar tells you what is the error of estimating it. And here on the right, you just have a histogram showing you exactly what was the precision of estimating each parameter. But this just shows you in a nutshell that we can estimate all these parameters with a relative error that is below less than 0.1%. And that's really, really damn precise for these kind of experiments. Specifically, we can increase the precision by order of magnitude from what's the best guess that the experimental team had before. These tools are also these tools are also really great in terms that they are scalable for testing many different realization of your experiment. Once the network is trained, it's trained. And it takes, even on the PC that I am using now to give this talk, it takes less than one second to evaluate it. So it takes enormous effort to train it. We have to do that on the cluster. We need a lot of data. But once it's trained, it's amazing. And you can just run it on a normal CPU which means that when we have these trained models, we can test super many things that would be relevant for the experiment. One example that I want to show you here is that we could easily test how the precision of the Hamiltonian determination, how the precision of the physics determination scales with number of measurements we do. Specifically, we found we could we could easily run enough experiments to find out that at the beginning we were asking the experimental team to take around 10 to the 4 experimental measurements except that this is pretty costly for them taking each of these projections it actually takes a few minutes so wanting them to do 10 to the 4 of them that's again very long experimental time and on this plot, you see that even if you go all the way to the 10 to the 3 number of experiment, a number of measurements that you need to take, the error doesn't decrease that, doesn't decrease that much. So we were actually by doing this numerical optimization and trying very many different things for our network, we were able to just tell them, oh, you can just measure an order of magnitude less. And this is just one example. There is many hyperparameters that the experiments have. And when you have these flexible models, you can just test them. OK, so that was the, that was the first thing. That was the first part about determining, these, determine, determining the physics from experimental measurements without the need of simulating the Hamiltonians. 
Also, maybe let me mention that the, another good thing about it is that is that this kind of philosophy translates to many other systems as well. Meaning, I show I showed you the specific example with the specific example with the with the ultra cold atoms and an optical lattice. But you can do the same. You can do the same with uh, with uh, any other any other Hamiltonian system that you would like to you would like to explore. Maybe this is a good time for me to just pause for ten seconds and ask if anyone has a questions about this first part. I don't see anything in the chat. So, but if you have any questions, please post it. Yep, uh, no questions on uh, YouTube right now, but okay, I'm then... trying to follow it. I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you, perfect. Then we can just continue. So then the second thing I wanted to mention is this challenge number two. I advertised at the beginning of my talk, and that's the automated control of the quantum device. So I showed this figure already before. What you what you want is human-like experience to do some pretty complicated task in the lab that makes your device do exactly what you do, what, what you want, and ideally without a person standing next to it and checking everything. So let me show you how this works on a, on a concrete experimental example again. So this is an experiment that we did back when I was uh, still at ETH with, uh, with quantum dots. So quantum dots, uh, quantum dots are a different type of a quantum device. It's a semiconductor system and your qubits are now not atoms, but they are electrons that are trapped and manipulated in some, in some semiconductor structure. I see, see a question, there's a question, yes. But I yes. think maybe I leave that I leave that question to the to the end, maybe. If Tomash is okay with that, that that might be a longer that might be a longer discussion. Uh, right. So so this is a this is a this is a this is a, a electron microscope picture of these three quantum dots. So the 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 circles are where the where the electrons are trapped. So you can trap a single electron, isolate it in all three spatial dimensions, and then manipulate it as you like. And those electrons are the will be your qubits. And then these light things that you see here in the figure, they are so-called gates. They are electrodes that help you manipulate and do those spins, do exactly exactly as you want. These uh, these semiconductor systems, by the way, they are super they are super scalable because it's it's super tiny. Like really, you just have three electrons sitting next to each other. So they are very promising. However, you have much less level of control than what I was talking about, about these ultra cold atoms in the optical lattices, for example, because, because not, now you are in a, in a true semiconductor. It's, and there is all this, there is all this, yeah, many electron, many electron problem interaction and spin, spin orbit coupling and all of these things. So, so there is typically lots of noise experimentally and indeed it takes a lot of extra control and lots of extra precise pressure to really make them do exactly what you want. So how we typically characterize this kind of experiment is using this plot that I am now showing here on the on the left. And this is something called charge stability diagram. On the two axes, you will have two voltages. I will just show it now for two gates. Specifically, it will be this one and this one, but it's not super important. You have two voltages and the color scale is the derivative of the current that is going through the device. So when you have these blue lines and your current is changing a lot, what happens is that electron is added into the dot. This island here means zero, zero state. 
If I cross one line, I will get one electron in the left dot and zero electrons in the right dot. If I would cross this one again, I would get two electrons in the left dot, zero electrons in the right dot. On the other hand, if I go from this island up, I get one electron in each dot and so on. And these, num these electronic number states, they, are, they will be your quantum computing basis. So what researchers want is to be able to prepare them like as, as fast and as precisely as possible. Now the problem with that, this picture of course is super beautiful. And now when I explained to you how to count this transition, anyone can tell me what to do and which voltage to pick if I tell you I want to state for two. You will know immediately what to do. The problem is that the acquire the plot of this quality, you need to take super, super many, super long measurement and someone is standing there and tuning tiny steps manually because it's, it's actually really hard to collect such a plot. So we did this thing. This time we are using something convolutional net, uh, convol something called convolutional neural network for those who know. We decided to only measure small subsets of this charge stability diagram, feed it into a neural network that classifies the, edgy, the, the edges of this window and decides whether there is a transition that is horizontal, vertical or both. And based on this, it makes a decision to shift diagonally, diagonally up or down or, or, or just down or to the left or to the right. And like this, we can just measure very small, subsist very small subsystems of this charge stability diagram, feed back what the network decided, then do the next measurement, then do the next measurement, and prepare these charge states with much, much less measurements than was previously required. So these are the images of the real experimental runs that we did. So here we wanted to prepare state 2-1, two, two electrons on the left, one electron on the right. One thing that I really want you to notice is how coarse this measurement is. Compared to this, we took uh, about order of magnitude less data. And maybe somewhere here you would be even confused, just like with naked eye, whether there is a transition or not. But the neural network learns enough from the course data. And then the pink line shows you how the algorithm walked this, this charge stability diagram and exactly how it end up, ended up in the in the in the state we wanted. Full disclosure, the, the precision of this thing is not 100%. So sometimes you need to run it a couple of times, but it's still something that fully autonomously, fully autonomously um, controls these voltages. The decision of these neural networks is directly connected to the voltage tuning of the experiment. So you can just like turn it on and come back in a few minutes and you will find your system in this desired charge state. And we are, we are it's, it's, it's for me, it's very exciting to see real experiments switching to this kind of, to this kind of controls. Let me just like super superficially mention another application that I'm also excited about, but again, this is going to be just a superficial thing. When you are building lots of these quantum devices, you need two dimensional, two dimensional materials. You might have heard about graphene that's everywhere. That's one example of the two dimensional materials and there are many others. On the picture that I have here in the background, that's for example, a hexagonal boron nitride. You exfoliate these materials. These flakes are super, super tiny. And you pick the correct ones and you need to sandwich them together, then put some electrodes on top of it and more or less you get a quantum device. However, finding on the sample the correct flakes that you want to use that are exactly the right color, shape, material, thickness, that's like super hard again. And it's, it's, it's very experience based because they have so many different colors and shapes and a lot of within this spectrum could actually be suitable. And the really good ones are very hard to come, come by. But again, we did such a thing and it's nothing and it's nothing too, and it's nothing too crazy. It's just a deep, 
is just a very deep uh, feed forward neural network that just controls the mic that just is connected to the api of the microscope controls it while it's scanning this is the live video from the glove box and this is this is the this is the neural network picking the flakes the experimentalists should look at in the morning so again it's such a thing that is like very practical someone would have to spend 16 hours standing staring into that microscope now we just line up the the chips and you come in the morning to a small set of 80 flakes you can just look at pick one and move on with your life so there's just like second practical application that I wanted to mention. Before I finish, let me quickly self-advertise two things. Uh, I, I also spent a lot of time, a lot of time teaching this, uh, this new discipline at the, at the boundary of, of machine learning and quantum physics. So we have a, we have a Jupyter book at ml-lectures.org and a, also, it's in the form of the, of the lecture note that is on archive just from this morning. And in case you prefer a published version or you read German, there is a, there is a published, published German book about it. And the second thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, is that I'm participating in something called Virtual Science Forum. We are an open access platform to organize scientific events. and we do a range of things we have uh, we have a regular colloquia but people also organize organize uh, summer schools or you can just invite yourself to give a talk and we will email to other mail to our mailing list people use it when they have a new archive release or something like that it's nice to have an accompanying video lecture we implemented this platform such that you only open issue on github and we do everything else. There will be automatically Zoom talk assigned advertisement emails and registration and website set up. So if you, for example, don't have an infrastructure to organize a school, we did absolute maximum to make it as easy as possible. So, and we really encourage students to organize their own schools and stuff. So, so if you feel like you would like to organize a school, but you don't have the administrative overhead, just head over to virtualscienceforum.org and we will, we will make it easy for you. And with that, let me also mention all my amazing collaborators, because while I'm giving talk, it's, it's my grad students who are doing the, the lion's share of work. So big thanks to everyone. And thank you all for listening. And I hope we can have some nice discussion now. OK, thank you very much for the great talk. And uh, I think we can now move on to the questions that were submitted. Let me start. I think. Can I ask you to stop sharing? I'm not sure if I can oh, block yeah. you out. Yeah, I can actually. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to share. Um, yeah, I want to make sure I, I'm sharing the right. I guess. This one. Yes, here it is. So we have collected the questions from the registration. And uh, we also wanted. We also added a few of our questions to the to the beginning, with uh, with Tonda. So actually, the first question is for me. I will I will ask it from you. So this all all sounded very academic science, and and my question is: Is it already something that um, that anyone used to make money already? Mm. I mean, you know, in the, in this scenario, you need to you need to define to make money, right? Because we have lots of companies, but then the question is, how many of them actually make the money on the on the quantum stuff? But what, what can I what can I say? Like in terms of applicability, like as I showed in the talk, these these experiments we are we are working with are are very real. I actually. I we just that was that was super that was super nice. We actually just received like a technology transfer grant, and I am working with the quantum metrology startup in Switzerland to 
to use this kind of techniques I was describing to enhance enhance their quantum sensors because that these problems with uh, noise and sensitivity it affects the accuracy of their devices. So there is a lot of there is a lot of technology transfer happening right now, but you yeah these these startups they are getting lots of funding in terms of making money this I, this I cannot claim or not. And in, in terms of other, other companies that I am perhaps not collaborating with, like since a few years ago, these kind of techniques, they are becoming, they are becoming more and more mainstream. So when you are, uh, yeah, I imagine, I imagine that, the, that the control and calibration of the Google chip has some elements of this, of this type of stuff embedded, embedded in it and so, and so on. So, I think in terms how we see how much it's improving the experiments that are already happening in the lab around the world, if we if we believe that quantum computers will will move to making money phase soonish, which I personally do, then I would say this is in a very similar category. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so Tonda? Right. Uh, yeah, my questions uh, were, uh, I guess, more related to the first part uh, of the presentation. Uh, I forget. I wanted to say thank you for the great presentation. It was like uh, beyond uh, what anyone would expect, I think, from just reading the title. It's very good. And uh, so, yeah, the first question was: um, I saw in some of your papers that you referenced uh, using neural networks to predict phase changes in uh, classical systems as well. And so I was just wondering what the key difference uh, is when you, uh, you know, employ neural networks to predict phase change in classical and quantum systems. Wow, that's a that's a really great question. So, in terms of in terms of architecture, almost nothing because the data you feed into the network, it's always classical. The problem is that in one case you you just take a classical like this spin up and down I was showing at the beginning, you just take that and give it to the network. In the second sense, you need to figure out how to sample it efficiently or how to con collect measurements that are useful. So in this quantum cases, there goes a lot of work into, into preparing the data. I didn't want to make the talk too complicated, but for example, for this, uh, for this ultra cold atoms, if I need to take 20,000 measurements for one realization of the experiment, and I have about 50 parameters that I want to estimate, so that's, yeah, you can, yeah, that, that would be, that would be 20,000 times 50 only the number of data points if I would have a one data point for each parameter combination. So that just doesn't work. Like this scalability problem is the transfer to this training sets. So what we do instead is that we find useful correlators that we can calculate from experimental data. And that what we actually show the network is for example, a vector with a 200 most important correlators. So there is a lot of physics knowledge coming into figuring out what this is and what actually matters in that system. And then we shrink it down to this vector that is only 200 long. And there is not a problem to, to, to generate half a million of them and train a monster model. But the, the model in, in itself, it's, it's input output, it's, it is what it is. And in some cases, you vary the input size, so you have reasons to use recurrent networks, or you know, or you have a or you have a basic building blocks beyond which the correlations doesn't know. So you have a good reason for a convolution. So there is a little bit of this architecture that has to do with the correlation length in your system, but but the building of the model itself isn't that different from building the one for classical systems. Great, uh, thank you. I uh, sort of was getting the feeling uh, when I read uh, a little bit. So I think we can skip the next question because you answered it already, in my opinion, uh, just now. Uh, I was going to ask about uh, sampling the training set, essentially, and uh, you know, putting your trust in uh, out of sample predictions of the neural network. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the final question I had was, uh, if you had in mind um, some kind of experiment that would uh, you know, demonstrate a phase change that can be, uh, you know, either because it's impossible, 
like that can be only predicted with neural network, uh, either because it's impossible to solve it analytically, or you know it's just really hard uh, because of the size of the system. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that you mentioned this fidelity susceptibility, right? Like fidelity susceptibility, there's just like a, there's just like a specific heat, like for quantum mechanics, like yes. mm -hmm. it's it's amazing, right? But then yeah, yeah, indeed, like you calculate it, you calculate it by by calculating overlaps of two wave functions. So if you don't have them, then it's then it's problematic. But that said, I don't know about I don't know about phase transitions that wouldn't be that wouldn't be captured by this maybe there was something about like a topological phase transitions with with like in like a randomly generated quantum circuits that are measurement based but then i would be talking too much on the top of my head like in general yeah discovering these phase transitions is challenging because yeah we don't we don't know the the phases are there so there is like a few super specific examples like some of this some of these uh, Hubbard models in optical lattices, they have phases that are, that people think maybe there is a phase transition, but like nobody knows. And when you throw a many body localization in the mix, then it's completely unknown. And I was, I was super happy to see that people were trying to, people were trying to look into these things. So hopefully maybe we will see something experimentally soon. And then there are uh, then there are uh, quantum sy synchronization models that are also that are also complex, and I know that people are trying this. But again, yeah, this is this is uh, this is a hard work. Like it's uh, yeah, we would we would wish we just give the network the new data and see see all the phases immediately. But there is so many problems that come with like collecting exactly enough amount of data in a correct parameter regime. So I guess, yeah, for me, the answer would be like, uh, ha, like, yeah, this class of Hubbard models in optical lattices, I think that is something that we can find using these methods. Hey, thank you. I was asking uh, a little bit, uh, you know, I was uh, like hunting sensations because uh, that's what attracts attention, right? When uh, you know, these, uh, for example, new molecules or uh, whatever come up from uh, from the neural nets. So uh, I think I'm gonna ask Aurel again to uh, to uh, keep uh, asking the questions, right? Because uh, he knows them best, I think. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the obvious Thank questions. Um, I will. Um, so the. Okay. Let me start with the first one. Maybe this is a bit too specific, so the, or maybe you have answered them. So, which types of AI or deep learning or machine learning algorithms are you using to perform these studies? You mentioned the neural networks, and and I, uh, did you mention anything else? <laughs> right. So, I think first thing I want to say there is a lots of lots of cases where actually throwing the neural networks at it, it's not the best solution ever. So. I think like a good typical workflow is first start one of this clustering algorithm. Like for example, this uh, T neighbor stochastic embedding, T Smith, it's super powerful and it finds like so many cool things and it performs just as well as a neural network sometimes and and you don't have to train it so that's one thing that i would say outside of the outside of the neural network and then another another super super like powerful thing is reinforcement learning there are cases that i didn't cover in this talk but oftentimes when you when you are for example doing this like parameter estimation in a quantum system you don't want to acquire all your measurements at once because what if they are the wrong ones so you acquire a little bit and then you have a reinforcement learning telling you what you should measure next the same way when the reinforcement learning learned to play mario run it can also learn to walk these high dimensional parameter spaces and sort of tell you where to measure next so reinforcement learning is also something that we are using a using a, a lot and then there is this like super new thing called automatic differentiation which is like which is like seems maybe even more powerful and a little bit easier to train than reinforcement learning and works on a works on a similar type of problem so these are the these are the things i would mention okay thank you 
Um, maybe I will skip the second question because uh, it was it's a question about how to use quantum computers for this uh, for for learning, but this is not precisely your field. But if you want to comment on it, I think you can. Oh, to, to this I will to this I will only say is that to my knowledge we don't the 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 the, the theoretical benchmarks that exist like you have like for a short algorithm speed up bosonic sampling speed up this optimization is not so clear so we have we have a lots of we have a lots of hope that that. Uh, that they will that they will solve these optimization problems specifically by doing by doing variational optimization, but the there is in many cases not a theoretical proof for that. Yeah, that's that's maybe like the only thing that I feel like it's it's worth worth saying out loud. So in that sense, this direction is way more experimental than like going and simulating a quantum chemistry Hamiltonian. Let's say. Okay. Thank you. And um, I think there are a few, there's a, maybe I will skip to the next one, the fourth one. So are there any, do you know any quantum versions or techniques that would be available to stochastic modeling? So essentially, I mean, you only mentioned optimization. Yeah, oh, this is, ah, uh, this is, yeah, this is, this is a, this is a hard, this is a hard question and specifically specifically the quantum thing okay this i am really this i'm really not an expert on what i am going to recommend are papers by maria schult she is a leading expert on using a, a classical normal like a kernel embeddings but using as a kernel thing the all the space that Hilbert space gives you so that's that's promising to this and I imagine that this kind of logic could have could have some applicability as being embedded in the in some like recurrent network framework but but that's all that's all I can say about it mm -hmm. okay so fifth question, I think it was somehow similar to what I have asked before, and you made a very, very exhaustive answer to that. And uh, these are again, fifth one is about applications of quantum machine learning. And then we have a very philosophical question. Do you think that AI will play a significant role in understanding fundamental laws of universe? And of course, if the universe is quantum, then then it is your expertise to answer. Um, right. So okay, I guess that I am personally I am personally on the side on like not believing this super much however we have like a few on a small systems there is a few super super cool things where for example group of renato renner at eth zurich they have a paper in prl i think last year it was published and they have a net they have a model variational autoencoder based model that takes the that takes the data from like that takes on that takes just the data from a very simple physics problem. For example, Kepler's problem. It just takes the coordinates that the, the, what you can measure in the sky. And in the in the in the oh my god, now I'm missing the word. Yeah, in the kernel space, in the compressed space of the variational autoencoder, it transforms the variable such that it solves the Kepler problem in a sense that is heliocentric. So this is such a super tiny thing, but somehow the, the, the model just from data figured out that the most efficient way to so, to to so, to save this. The, the information about this problem is to save it in the basis of the angles from the sun. And this is this is super funny, right? So somehow there is a lots of this, lots of this like 
discovery thing, discovery thing happening on the on this like small system levels. But for me personally, I have really hard time seeing generalizing this to this like a, a really true discovery. Like, for example, if you know about concepts of topological quantum phase transitions, you can totally use an AI to search for a new topological quantum phase transition, like I, would, I was discussing in the talk. Or like, if you have a suspicion there is like some extra correction to a gravitational law that we didn't think about before, then you can use neural network to help you act to, to help you explore the parameter space that will best fit to your experimental data and so on. But it's like completely discovery from scratch. I think we are far from that, in my opinion. But if that would happen in my lifetime, that would be freaking amazing. OK, thank you. Um, so you had this is going to be an audience question. And, and I was wondering whether I should keep it there. But I have to say that it makes a good point. So this is question number nine. You had quantum matter in the title of your presentation. But I think you didn't explain what you mean by quantum matter. Oh yeah, this is yeah, this is this is a, this is a great point, and it kind of brings it back to this to this um, to this definition of quantum computer that I had at the beginning that is a little bit biased. So for for me, quantum quantum matter is everything that has a that has a yeah quantum effect in it like a small enough piece of graphene is quantum matter but the superconducting chips with 50 qubits on it is also a quantum matter and uh, and uh, yeah the whatever chemical 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 thing i want to study is also quantum matter like whenever i whenever quantum physics plays a role that like fits into the quantum matter description and it will be uh, everything from condensed matter spin liquid thing to to these computational chips with quantum devices why i talk about quantum matter more broadly and not about quantum computing is that a lots of these systems i discuss they can perform computations these for example the quantum dots and ultra cold atoms you can implement gates and they can do that but in my opinion much more powerful thing is this quantum simulation right now at least at the stage of the technology we are at meaning i can use these devices to simulate physics i cannot simulate otherwise so it's not a computer in the sense of like factorize this big number for me, which I don't know, would not be super interesting for me right now. But what is super interesting is to is to have a Hamiltonian that I cannot solve with any of the variational techniques I have available. But if I stuff enough atoms in this optical lattice, I can find the ground state or I can study out of equilibrium physics and do all of, all of this stuff. So, so let's say that computing is a subset of what all these devices can do. And I am very interested in computing, but also in all the things that come outside of computing. And that would be the simulation of complex phenomena that we cannot access otherwise. OK, thank you. Now we have a few more questions that are somehow, let's say, career oriented. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can, or I mean, to what extent you can answer to this yourself being also at the beginning of your career they're very young for what you have achieved and um, the so one of this was this is question number eight so what is the scope of quantum computers technology in science and analytics right now and the question why it is so would you advise a professional data architect or scientist to pursue this field so it kind of this kind of brings up back, back bring us back to the question that you that you asked at the beginning about these things making money right like we are still we are still in a in a pre competitive stage of this technology and we have ideas about where to where to apply it but it's not that yeah there is a lot of words a lot of words quantum in a lot of like financial applications, but the, I wouldn't, 
yeah the, the question is how much the how much the quantum computers are actually doing right now and and the the size of the devices we have they are not they are not like actually solving some like super large scale problems we cannot solve otherwise that said there is something that i like through my work with world economic forum i realized something super i realized something super important that doesn't come up in the scientific context because we are all oh you need to understand properly and you need to do all of this stuff before it's commercially available and that's true however imagine this imagine that you are a pharmacy company and all your business model is based on having a huge labs where people are trying by hand all the combinations of different experience, different different ingredients for your new vaccine or your new medicine because there is no other way to do it how much would your business model change if you could suddenly just launch heavily parallelized simulation that will just solve that in three days on the cluster like and so people in these big companies are worrying about that. And lots of big companies are hiring people who understand these things because it's important to be, to be prepared because there are specific industries that we can already identify that this is going to affect long term. And especially if you are a huge player in your field, it will not work like that you just buy a quantum computer, press a button and it will be solved. You, you need to understand what aspects of your process you will outsourcing and stuff like that. So in this context, I think that if you are a computer engineer, it's very valuable. Like for example, like IBM, Microsoft, all these big companies, they have their quantum programming languages and they have all these cool tutorials. And you actually don't, you don't learn like super much about this like quantum matter and wave function and stuff, but you learn this circuit quantum computing. You learn simple algorithms. You learn to understand what is a, what is a quantum speed up. So I think that is, that is definitely a place in a workplace for people like that already now because the companies are anticipating in this change. And again, I am in the field, but in my opinion, rightly so. So I think there is no need to like studying yeah we all need to study like for five years of like quantum physics to like calculate this stuff but there are all these tutorials that are very you know kind of front end of the quantum thing that are that are easy to follow and would like bump up your cv to work for a, such a company that is interested in in uh, accommodating these technologies i would say but indeed my experience is limited in this direction Oh, thank you. I'm very glad that you mentioned learning quantum programming using these these uh, kits because this is one of the main activities of QWorld. So our Q Bronze workshops allow people to learn the basics. And in case you didn't know, there was there's going to be more advanced pieces to silver. So mm -hmm. so thank you for 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 mentioning this. I'm really happy. And um, I think there's there's one question so uh, that I would. And here, this is number ten. Maybe this. Ah, okay. So let me let me read the chat. Okay. So I have one. Um, okay. The first one is more about how to use quantum computers. I think we have already mentioned that you that that you are not the best person to ask, but you gave reference. And then from Evo, there's a question. So when using neural networks one usually faces the problem of interpretation of the parameters of the networks. So you don't know why the network is the way it is. Is there any quantum specific method to interpret it? Oh my God, I love this question. And yeah, I, yeah, we are we are almost yeah, we are almost ready with the paper, but I didn't manage to submit it before, the, before, this, before this talk. So what I can comment on is, it's not about it's not so much using a quantum methods to interpret a classical learning, but we we realize that you can you can use quantum methods to interpret this uh, quant neural network trained on a qu quantum data. Specifically, we started adjusting the architectures of the neural network to reflect the the specific correlations that we know just by knowing the physics 
So when we use the cut, I didn't talk about that aspect so much, but you can use neural networks to search for a ground states of quantum models. So when we do something like that, we tailor the architecture to reflect those correlations. As in we ask, add extra neurons to calculate the correlators for us and keep them on the way. And by the, by the time we end up to the state we were looking for, there is a very concrete neurons we can look at and check their values and know which correlations they are asso associated to. So definitely this is such a great point. Like this interpretability is a, is a huge problem, but we find that we find that you can really you can really tweak the tweak the architecture to overcome this. And I think that some ideas around around that logic could be also could be also applicable in the to the to the classical problem, even though we did this for a you know for a very specific quantum Hamiltonian people are trying to solve. So so yeah, dependent what your interest is, I am happy you can email me or something. Like I'm happy to discuss further. But at least in a in a quantum in a quantum world, there is a we are getting a little bit we are getting a little bit better at, at interpreting the quantum thing the, the network is doing. Okay, thank you. So there's one more career related question. So do you have any opportunity to get involved in ongoing quantum projects? And this was asked by, I can think of leading software development or someone who wants to join as a PhD researcher. Oh, like as in, if you are a PhD, if you have opportunity to- I think it's a question directed like to you. So whether you have, you, you can offer opportunities, I guess. But... Oh, if I can offer opportunities. Yes. I mean, yeah, sure. Like we are like, yeah, you can on, on our website, you can see like the current openings we have and like, yeah, we are, yeah, on of hiring based on how the how the grants come in, but we are always looking for a, for a talented people to join our team and and basically the the projects we are working on are very much the type I was I was discussing like either we develop develop like theoretical methods to understand quantum matter or we are collaborating with uh, leading experimental teams or companies to help them solve their problems and interpret interpret their experiments better mm -hmm. okay i see so i don't know how much uh, time you still have do you want to return to thomas question about <laughs> i even don't understand oh, yeah. what it is generative <laughs> adversarial network or uh, or do you leave it for for uh, for private <laughs> yeah no no i think i can i can quickly i can quickly answer i think i will just like i will just refer refer back to to my answer what i was saying about this about this renato renner papers and clearly tomash knows so variational autoencoders to to learning to learning physics so yeah i i don't think i don't think we will like build a gun that will just vomit the new theories but I can build a gun that helps me create samples that looks like experimental data and train my models better without some poor person have to measuring it for me. So it's again, yeah, it's again the same thing. You can do, you can do useful, reasonable stuff and you can do them scalably and in a decent time. But yeah, it's not that there is there is no, I think, generative adversarial network that will just have a knowledge of the universe by watching us doing physics for a while. <laughs> okay, I think, um, I don't know if I ask, if I should ask this last question. Will we be able to transfer consciousness using quantum technologies as shown in Traveler's TV series? <laughs> <laughs> right. like i mean if we take it if we take it to the if we take it to the most like extreme extreme like if we take the teleportation protocol to the furthest extreme then like hypothetically yes like in the next 50 years most probably no <laughs> okay okay i just meant it as a 
as an as a, as an interesting <laughs> question for the last. So then, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you With, so much for having me. Yeah, thank you very much for for this uh, for the talk and also your patience for answering to all these questions. I I also thank the audience for participating, and um, it's everything is all going to be available on YouTube, so you can uh, share and you can watch it once more, or if you had, or if you joined in later, you can. So thank you very much, and um, see you next time. Have a nice evening or whatever your time zone is. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>